So I have to um, thank Anna for uh, such a kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and I have to say that um, um, I often blame my dad and mom for everything, uh, both the good uh, and the bad. But so far, I think that they've been fortunate. Everybody blames them for the good things and blames me for the not so good things. I really uh, want to um, start first by expressing uh, how delighted I am, uh, Professor Kevin Nash and Dr. Anna uh, McKenna, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, closing keynote of what I understand is the inaugural forum uh, for, the, uh, for Africa research. Uh, and I like the acronym FORA. It's one of those days where uh, I should, or I should say one of those 24 hours where I accepted to speak at three uh, events, uh, one of them at the business school and this one, and then tomorrow morning uh, at the Africa Society event. Uh, so one, some of what I will say, um, you may hear tomorrow, but I doubt it because I've worked hard so that I can say different things uh, at the two events. So I still encourage you, if you're planning to, uh, to listen to me uh, tomorrow. But the reason I started uh, by saying that was I was really looking forward to uh, attending this event uh, the whole day. And because when I looked at the program, I thought, oh my God, such distinguished speakers uh, and such amazing sessions. Indeed, um, uh, Anna and Kevin, I think you're leading an absolutely amazing initiative. So if this is my little bit uh, to contribute to what you're doing, uh, um, uh, please you know, use me in whatever way you think I can to help this. But I have to say that the attraction for me is also that I've always marveled at the great work of researchers. From very early in my life, and I always tell these stories about uh, when I was young, I had always liked the idea of inventing something. So in 1979, in boarding school in Nigeria, when it was my turn to meet the career counselor, I told her that I wanted to share confidential information with her and I explained that I neither wanted to be an engineer, which is what my father was, or a medical doctor, because my mom was a nurse and my father wanted me to be an engineer and my mother wanted me uh, to be uh, a doctor. And if, you're, if you have Nigerian parents, you know that they traditionally tell you what to do and um, they want to be the mothers of doctors, lawyers, and uh, and um, en engineers. So the career counselor was actually very nice uh, and she asked me what I really wanted to do. And I did say to her that I want to be an inventor of something in science that would change the world and leave an indelible mark on society. We had several conversations. She told me about computer science. I thought that's the fastest route to become an inventor. That's how my first degree is in computer science. After 35 years, I'm still waiting to invent something. <laughs> so you can be assured, Anne and Kevin, that the connection to researchers is something that I actually want. Maybe I can invent something together with some of you. But I also do think that from early in my life, I really felt that research has the power to transform our world. But I also appreciate Oxford. One of the things that Kevin and Anne and I sh uh, shared with me, Anne shared with me when I visited with them, was that Oxford was focusing on Africa uh, as a priority, as a strategic priority. I believe the Africa Oxford Initiative, which you're leading, 
must be the epicenter of that goal. And that fora, which brings together researchers from different fields, must help to ensure that that aspiration is realized. So, I wasn't sure what to title my closing keynote, but I have titled it Accelerating Africa's Prosperity Through Innovative Partnerships for Research. But maybe I should say Accelerating Society's Prosperity Through Innovative Partnerships for Research. Because I do think that where Africa goes is where the world will go. So permit me to start by sharing my view of where the world is today. And I must start by acknowledging that there has been momentous progress in the world, in Africa. Two centuries ago, the vast majority of the world's population lived in abject poverty. As recently as 1950, 75% of the world's population still lived in extreme poverty. By 1981, that figure had declined to 44%. And in 2015, 2016, which is the latest data that we have, it's about 10%. So there's been significant progress. And this is despite a sevenfold increase in population. But I would also venture to say that a lot of what we've seen in the progress on poverty has come out of the 30-year expansion in China, and to a lesser extent, a few other countries. But, nine out of 10 people that live in extreme poverty live on the continent of Africa. And today, as you know, it is those who live on less than $1.90 uh, a day. And I can't even buy a sandwich in Oxford with $1.90. But I think even more significant is the wide-ranging challenges that the world faces, whether it's the weaknesses in the global economy, high unemployment, whether it's some of the political disruptions. I believe there's a political leadership crisis uh, in our world. Uh, in the US, there's a fractured politics, which is fueling divisions in respect of race, social class, political ideology. In the UK, the long, complex, and laborious Brexit process, no deal, deal, no deal, uh, in my view, has broken trust completely uh, in the UK political leaders. There are election surprises everywhere. Populism, nationalism, all flourishing while people are asking questions about the liberal order and democracy. Traditional ally alliances are being unraveled with things like the Iran nuclear deal or the, uh, the US-Korea uh, talks that have stalled. But I still feel that the most important challenges are extreme poverty, inequalities, the potential abuse of emerging technologies like using technology as a weapon of war. And of course, over the last two months, uh, fueled by the anxiety of young people, political leaders are now saying that the climate issues are a crisis, that they're existential. I just always love the way that Oxfam explains the condition of the world. Oxfam says 1% of the world's population own more wealth than the rest of us. I'm not in that 1%, I'm obviously in the 99%. 26 people own the same wealth as the poorest half of humanity. 262 million children 
and not in school. 10,000 people die every day because of a lack of access to affordable health care. And they rightly note that the cost of this is devastating. It obviously undermines the fight against poverty and it fuels public anger that continues to create divisions in a world where there's so much reason for us to come together because this world is the same wherever you are. Uh, and this morning uh, at the business school, at the Responsible Business uh, Conference, I said to them, my view is that poverty anywhere is poverty everywhere. Because I was asked to give the Southern perspective and I said, there's no Southern perspective. It's the same perspective, it's the same world that we all live in. Some of what we've seen, I mean, I, I, I've always worried about climate deniers and I don't know what they deny because from the east to the west, from the north uh, to the south, there are natural disasters occurring frequently. They're more extreme. And people think that the losses annually are more than $300 billion. So I don't know what it will take climate deniers to know uh, where the world is. But I am comforted that Africa will be the engine of the future of the world because Africa still has wealth that is untapped. And I'll probably talk a bit more in detail about that tomorrow. My hope is that the economic expansion, which was buoyed by inventions, innovation, over the last 200 years, that was fostered by research, will be what will unleash this wealth. So I believe that scaling research through laudable initiatives sponsored by Airfox will probably be the game changers for the future. The game changers that will foster prosperity, foster peace, and enable us to realize the Sustainable Development Goals. In the course of my career, I have seen firsthand the value of research and innovation. I looked at the program and I, no and I noted that some of the earlier presentations were on vaccines. And it reminded me of the International Financing Facility for Immunization which the UK sponsored along with other governments. And I was humble and humbled enough to have been appointed as one of the pioneer board members. And I saw in a very short time how when people come together, they can make a difference. This was an initiative to try and make sure that funding was available today to help vaccinations in the 70 poorest countries in the world. Yet, the donor countries had money over 20 years. People got together and put together a structure that allowed this new entity to go to the capital markets and raise what is today more than $4 billion through private sector to be able to fund the introduction and the implement, sorry, the, 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 the uh, fund the research and the production of vaccines by international pharmaceutical companies. Similarly, in June 2017, while at the World Bank, I was fortunate to have joined the work that led to the launching of the world's first pandemic bond that would provide such funding for pandemics that emanate from developing countries. That was a big deal for us. Why was it a big deal for us? It was a big deal because everyone on the board of the World Bank had seen how devastating the Ebola crisis was in 2013, 2014. I lived in Nigeria and we missed it just by a hair. 
if that's the, 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 the right um, phrase, because of the hard work of Nigerians, of the government, uh, and because everybody recognized that if Ebola hit what is a population of 200 million people today, it was going to hit the world. But the board watched and saw that because the world did not respond as quickly as it should, that there were more deaths in Guinea, in Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and all of the economic gains that these three countries had had in the recent past had basically been wiped out by this pandemic. And said, health people, work with the World Health Organization, Treasury, you say you know innovative finance, come together and do this. I continue to see the manifestation of the power of research every day. In 2016, I listened to Jeanine Dorden, the co-founder of CRISPR. I don't know if I'm saying it right, CRISPR, because it doesn't have uh, an E, so I struggle. And I was overwhelmed with emotion as to the possibility of curing sickle cell disease. This was a condition that had inflicted unimaginable havoc on many families. My own cousin died at age 30. And even though it's been more than 30 years, I still remember her vividly because she was so full of life. She, was, she had so much ahead of her. And she just didn't survive it, even though we were told that by the time you're age 30, you're likely uh, to survive. So when I listened and heard about CRISPR, the new kind of genetic engineering that gives scientists the power to edit DNA much more easily than in the past, when I was told that the traditional gene therapy uses viruses to insert in new genes into cells to try and treat diseases, while CRISPR treatments largely avoid the use of viruses, so it's therefore safer. I was elated. But more recently, as I've been following things, I see that there's the prospect of gene editing to cure cancer, which has been devastating for society, rich or poor. I mean, this is a disease that doesn't say, oh, you're very poor, you don't have a lot of money, so maybe I'll, I'll go to you. Cancer is devastating for everyone. Conservation is another area that I followed. It's not, I'm, and I'm not familiar with any of these issues, but I hope that I'm speaking to each one of you because when I looked at the program, these were some of the topics that were being covered. And in a conversation recently, someone told me about the natural conservancy experience in the United States and the work that they've done with water funds. And the immediate thing that came to my mind was, this is the solution for the issues around River Nile. Because as some of you may know, there's a three-way dispute among Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan over the sharing of the Nile waters, which remains deadlocked, despite Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who's been amazing in trying to build coalitions and, and bring peace. As you know, Ethiopia's uh, 2011 decision to build the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam which is expected to be the largest hydropower plant in Africa triggered this. While Egypt fears that the dam will drastically reduce water flow downstream and thus imperil its, natural, its national security, Ethiopia and Sudan assert the right to exploit the River Nile to further develop their economies. I give these examples just to say that can you imagine the possibilities with the research that people in this room can do? One of the key elements of the approach, Kevin and Anne, that you've taken that I consider innovative is really 
building that partnership between a researcher on the African continent and a researcher at the University of Oxford. Oxford, of course, brings a wealth of experience from almost 900 years of convening the best, the brightest, and the most committed to transforming our world. This AFOX approach also recognizes the value of leveraging local knowledge and experience from the best and the brightest of Africa. I'm reminded by the value of local experience and knowledge by the New York Times bestseller, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Has anybody read the book? I love researchers. There are many more people who've read the book than anywhere else I've asked this question. Has anybody seen the movie? Okay, many more of us have seen the movie. And if you haven't seen it, you should see the movie. Um, I cried through the whole movie. Uh, this book is, of course, a true story about one of the authors, uh, William Kamkwamba, a young man who brought electricity to his Malawian village by building a windmill. There's so much that's interesting about this, because, of course, there wasn't enough money for, for his parents to pay uh, for school for him, so he was sent out of school. But his teachers, who loved him, connived with him so he could gain access to the library and read about how to make a windmill. Also compelling is that he uses scraps as well as parts from his father's bicycle to build this windmill. I remember uh, Chiwetel Ejiofo, uh, who uh, uh, directed the movie, explaining that it took several experts coming together to replicate what William Kapamba, who hadn't been to school for probably what was seven years, uh, had done to be able to bring electricity. He understood the environment. He was committed. He had local knowledge. He had experience. And necessity, of course, is the mother of invention. So I do believe that the partnership is extremely important. Another example that I want to give is what happened with Black Hole last month. And I can confess, I'd never, I don't remember reading. I remember reading about relativity and Einstein, but I just, but it was on the front page of the FT, it was on the front page of the uh, IHT, and I thought, I better find out what this is about. And please permit me, because it's not an area that I'm familiar enough with, to quote from one of the articles that I read, written by an Ethan, Ethan Siegel, on the 10 lessons from our first image of a black hole's event horizon. And I quote, the original idea of a black hole goes all the way back to 1783, when Cambridge scientist John Mitchell recognized, and I say Cambridge scientist intentionally, <laughs> recognized that a massive enough object in a small enough volume of space would render everything, even when with light, unable to escape from it. More than a century later, Carl Schwarzschild discovered an exact solution to Einstein's general relativity that predicted the same result, a black hole. Both Michel and Schwarzschild predicted an explicit relationship between the event horizon or the radius of the region from which light cannot escape, and the mass of the black hole as well as the speed of light. For 103 years after Schwarzschild, this prediction went untested. At long last, on 10th of April 2019, scientists revealed the first ever picture of a black hole whole event horizon. And it goes on and on to say Einstein's theory won again, as did all of science. But the reason this, for me, was important to share with you today is what one of the lead researchers said, Shepard Dolman. He said, if you want to build a global telescope, 
you need a global team. He recognized that one of the reasons for success was the partnership that this discovery had. It involved 200 people from 60 institutions in 20 countries. So I say to you, what has been birth in this inaugural fora, you need to take seriously, because the potential to change our world is enormous. And how many people have seen Black Panther? <laughs> you have to raise your hand loudly. <laughs> okay. So for me, that is utopia. For me, that tells you what the possibilities could be if we unleash Africa's wealth. And Africa's wealth ranges from renewable and non-renewable resources. It's the people. What I believe that fora should birth is those relationships that can unleash Africa's enormous wealth. Because as I said earlier, where Africa goes, the world goes. And in a borderless world, we can leverage our best and brightest. And I know that all of you in this room are our best and brightest, because this world needs us to try and address its challenges with a sense of urgency. Let me quote another author that is quite popular, uh, the late Hans Go uh, Roslin who wrote the bestseller, Factfulness. And I watched him dramatize what he said, which is that the seemingly impossible is possible. He said the seemingly impossible is possible. I say that research makes the seemingly impossible possible. Research is the game changer for a more sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous society. And your work will also help us conserve our planet. Thank you. I really can't thank you enough for that. That's a very hyped way to end this, hey? That all of you in everything that you do, in field work, in labs, in whatever you're doing, you're making the seemingly impossible possible. So when you have those dark days, remember that, hey? <laughs> uh, could we have a few questions if someone, um, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Cesar Atuire from Ghana, University of Ghana. And uh, anyway, thank you for giving us a, a good motivation to continue with research. And um, I just wanted to ask um, a simple question. It's perhaps, do you have your views on this? Since you've participated in government in Nigeria, in uh, decision-making, for the development of Africa through the ADB. Um, for those of us living in Africa, sometimes the question we need to ask or we're trying to ask and we hope we can find answers to is, um, yes, all these good things that you've mentioned, um, what are we doing wrong um, so that, yes, um, we still have many of our villages without water, without roads, um, our schools under trees, people dying. Um, could we not have done better? And our leadership, um, how do they develop some of our leaders that immune capacity to sleep well when their people are dying? It's, it's, it's a kind of immune, immunity, I think, that is developed. Uh, could you just walk us a little bit through that? Because some of us, I think, I mean, it's not, I mean, and my, my question, if you pardon me, it's not so much a judgment, but it's just trying to understand so that we can find solutions. Thank you. 
Okay. So, so I knew that it was the end of the day, and so I thought I'll keep it short and sharp uh, and focus, but are you all prepared to stay till tomorrow morning? Uh, because I, the questions he's asked require uh, all of that and probably plus more. I, I think the issues you've raised are absolutely fundamental issues. First, um, are we proud of where we are as a continent? I'm obviously not proud of it. Has there been um, a weakness in leadership? Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, I say to people, you can claim whatever you want, but the results on ground show us. Third, which is what I, I, I often say, it may have been bad in the past, it may have been good to have done it earlier, but the next best time, I think as a Chinese proverb, is now. And so the question I ask myself all the time is, wherever I am, and this is why as I thought through what I would share with you, I tried in my own little way to put myself in the role of a researcher. Each one of us can make a difference. I think we're relying too much on the political leaders. And what we've seen around the world, I, I, um, uh, I wanted to talk about the global economy, I wanted to talk about the crisis that we're seeing around the world in political leadership. There is a crisis of political leadership. So what it means is that that gap must be filled. And that gap will be filled by every one of us who is privileged to be in this position. The other story that I often tell is that there's a woman who is my age, who I know very well, who is in my village, who every morning she goes to a stream. It used to be a, I mean, I don't know if to call it a river. Maybe when I was younger, it was called a river, but it used to have more water and it's much farther away. And every morning she wakes up at 5 a.m. to go to that stream, to go and fetch water so that her grandchildren can have something to eat, can have, you know, can, uh, can take a shower and all of that. How did I get here? I'm fortunate and everybody who's in this room who's able to attend this event is absolutely fortunate. And my father always said, to whom much is given, much is expected. So the question that I ask to each one of you who I consider a leader in this room, what are you doing? What will you do differently as a result of what you've heard in the course of this uh, uh, today to make that difference? It requires all of us, there's a lot to do. What has been my experience? I hope that others can say that in wherever I've been, I've tried to do my own bit. But I think that today we have tools that enable us, whether it's technology, whether it's the power of social media, where we can speak up, to do much more than was available in the past. The other thing is, are you going to run for office? Because I say to everybody, I think it was, was, it, was it Pluto who said, you know, you shouldn't complain if a riffraff governs you if you're not prepared to put yourself forward. And there are challenges to putting yourself forward. People have asked me and I've had the most fast, I've had them, I had the most fascinating experience working in government in Nigeria. Will I do it again? I said, absolutely, it's my country. I want my country to succeed. And I had an absolutely amazing time. And the challenge is make me who I am. So that's my final point, that we must make sure that we have people who have been invested in, be in leadership positions in governments. So I don't know if I've given you the short version or you want the version till six in the morning. <laughs> and they can offer us breakfast, I know that. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, there's three people who raised their hands and okay. I think there's a one in the back. So, Let's do one, two, three. And I will try and be brief. Okay. Yes. Mm. Thank you so Let's much. Thanks so much for the talk and your encouragement. It was very encouraging and motivational. Um, my name is Tim.
from Zimbabwe and a PhD student here uh, with EJ in zoology. Um, and I was just struck by um, the panel discussion on the collaborations and how many of them um, are funded by European institutions or North American ones. And then that, that figure about the 0.5% of trials being done by African institutions. Um, and now I think I speak for many other young Africans here who are thinking of maybe one, well, going back um, to our home countries and wanting to be part of the change in terms of the next, I don't know how long it's going to take, probably decades. Mm -hmm. But what, what advice would you give us as young people going back, if we want the situation to be different in three decades, what should our focus be? What should our values be? Where should we be putting our energies? Because okay. um, it's difficult for me to know that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just take the three of them together, yes. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much, Ma, for the, um, let me call it inspiration. My name is Damilola Ulisa. I'm from um, University of Reading. I'm doing a master's degree in communication and development, and I'm from Nigeria. My question is a follow-up to um, your statement as, um, concerning leadership. My question is, for the younger generation, you talk about um, picking up leadership position. I would want to ask, how do we break into leadership, especially, um, let's use Nigeria as an example, with the dominance of the um, older generation, considering the cabalism we already have in power? Hello, everyone. Okay. My name is Damola. I'm from Nigeria. My question relates to access to finance. As an outsider looking in, I think that um, we don't get enough, there's not enough sponsorship of R&D across Africa generally, and that um, inhibits innovation. So do you have any tips on what researchers could do to be able to access finance? And um, how can we sell this to private organizations, such as the sponsor it, maybe it's corporate social responsibility or whatever, but how do we break that bridge? Thank you. Um, I, I said these were the brightest and uh, the brightest minds, and I think that the, the, the issues you've raised are absolutely uh, very important issues. Uh, my younger brother from Zimbabwe uh, raised uh, the point around, uh, I think in a similar way, you know, what, are, what, what ideas do I have as to, and I think the, the, the person from the, the Nigerian from the University of Berlin as well, uh, raised a similar question, how do you break in, how do you contribute? Um, and it's also one of those questions that could keep us here for a very long time. So I'll, I'll share a few tips. First and foremost, preparation is absolutely essential. Um, and my view is there are no shortcuts. Hard work is extremely important if you want to contribute with integrity. Uh, and so spending the time that you're spending either in Berlin, uh, doing your master's in communications or doing a PhD here in Oxford is absolutely important. But I think every day when you wake up, you should ask, what does what I'm doing here mean for me to play a role? Whether here in Oxford, whether in the UK, whether in Asia, that will make a difference to society more generally. And if your specific area of interest is your home country, my view is that wherever you are, you can still make a difference. So preparation is one. The second is to keep your networks going. Uh, I was having a conversation with uh, Dami Lola uh, just before the session uh, started. And most people in Nigeria remember my altercation with the House of Reps because somebody asked me for a bribe and I refused to give the bribe and he put me on live TV and it was something that went on for several months and, 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 and on and on. And, um, and she was meeting me for the first time and said, oh, we were just talking about how I did it. And I said, one of the things that people don't realize that networks are extremely important. There were people who helped me in government, in the private sector. I'd been away from Nigeria for 22 years, but I kept my networks. And so when I landed in Nigeria and people thought, oh, this is somebody who's just returning. 
and hadn't been in the country for 22 years, they didn't realize there was a new sheriff in town. And that I had the networks, I had the relationships to support me in an agenda which was important, which was transforming the Nigerian capital markets and, and turning it to world class. So building your networks and keeping those networks is also something that I would advise. The third, and forgive me for saying this, I find that, um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll say it in a way that wouldn't be as offensive. In Nigeria, everybody wants to be the president of Nigeria. People don't want to do the work and pay the time that's required to get to an important position. So people recognize you when you've worked hard. I mean, Professor Kevin Mash has been at this forever. And so suddenly you want to be Professor Kevin Mash, but he's been working at it. So what I find that's not happening as much today because of the successes that we've seen with a lot of young people is that people suddenly want to become a professor. Mash, a Dr. Anne, McKenna, very quickly. Uh, and I think that making sure that you're properly prepared is extremely important. Doing that, so if I wanted to go into politics, I would consider as a young person serving as an aide to an executive, serving as an aide to a legislator or working with a private sector entity that shares my values, that is interested in supporting government, but thinking about what is that path that will get you to support your country. And I can have, you know, we, we can have another conversation because I can see Professor Marsh is thinking, oh, I need to close the session. Oh, okay, he doesn't want to close it. Okay, so we're all ready to stay till six. So maybe I can just um, touch on the, the question around access to finance. Um, it's a very important question. And there are people who have the view that access to finance is not the issue. That it's actually being able to package and put together the idea in a way that is compelling for an investor. There are people who think, oh, you can be creative in how you source capital. I'm of the view that access to finance is a big deal. It's actually the result. Because today, if I want to set up a business in America, you know, I can set it up very quickly, I can fail many times, and people will still want to fund me. In many African countries, that's not the case. But that is a business opportunity. You can do venture capital, one of the nations that I like very much in terms of the ecosystem around supporting research and development and new ideas is Israel. Israel is a small nation. It has some of the, it has the highest number of companies that are listed on the exchanges in the US, much more than, I mean, other than, other than the United States. But it's a very small country because they have a nation where the government, the private sector come together to see how they can support uh, R&D. Uh, there was the final question about what sector, what area. There's so much to do in many areas. There's so, much, there's so many ways you can influence in the private sector or in the public sector. Uh, and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Arumna. Absolutely inspired. And,